presenting a case <laughs> on SUSAC syndrome. Um, so this is a patient that has actually been seen in continuity in neuro-ophthalmology and retina and uveitis along with the neurology service. It's a 27-year-old girl who presented with one week of blurry vision in the left eye. She was originally uh, had, she's kind of a poor historian secondary to her neurologic status. Per her mom, in mid-December of 2014, she had kind of had an episode of dizziness, confusion, had went to an outside ER, had a CT scan, they, she had a history of migraines, they thought it was maybe an atypical migraine, was treated as such and was sent home. Christmas day of 2014, she developed nausea, vomiting, headache, worsening of her dizziness, um, didn't go back in to be seen, it kind of got a little bit better. Then again, uh, shortly after the new year, she again went back into the ER. At that point, she was not oriented to date. She wasn't able to perform her activities of daily living, including taking care of her children. Her mom was getting very concerned. Um, they had, they uh, did not admit her that time. They again thought it was maybe migraines related. She came back two days later. They admitted her again. She was admit, uh, oriented only to person. At that point, she was transferred up here to the university for further evaluation. Uh, her past medical history, so she has a PFO, she had hypothyroid, uh, migraine, depression, some hyperlipidemia at a young age, GERD, and then gestational diabetes during her second pregnancy, which had since resolved. Um, she'd had a couple surgeries. Her brother had epilepsy, secondary to a hypoxic brain injury, but otherwise her family history was relatively unremarkable, and she had two children. Uh, her list of medications, as you would expect with her uh, medical history. So, uh, she was admitted to the neurology service here, and then they asked for an ophthalmology consult, so she actually came over to the Moran for evaluation. When she was seen here, her vision was 20-20, so it's a little bit small. She did not have an APD. She did not have uh, any proptosis, and her anterior chamber, or anterior exam was unremarkable. Her posterior exam, so you can see she's also visited the glaucoma service, I should mention. Uh, she does have an increased cup to disc, but otherwise her macula on the right eye looked fairly unremarkable. She had not been having any symptoms in her right eye. And then her left eye, we can dim the lights just a little bit. Uh, so again, she has increased cup to disc, but of note, she has this sort of arterial wall plaque that's not necessarily at the bifurcation, but sort of extending along the mid arterioles. And then you can subtly see probably here, there's also just this sort of whitening, uh, which you'll see in other slides is some edema in that area of that, of that section of the retina associated with that arterial pattern. This is her OCT finding when she first presented. So you can see, interestingly, if you look, her central fovea actually looks really good, but if you, as you move superiorly into the area where the uh, occlusion of this artery look to be at, you start to see that you have disruption of the inner retinal layers. Uh, whereas the outer retina layers are still preserved in that area. But you can see you sort of lose the natural architecture of the inner layers of the retina. This was her original FA at presentation. So you can see she does have a patent ciliary retinal artery. And then as we move through, we have a lot of pictures, so I'll kind of move quickly through. But as you move through, you can clearly see that she doesn't have good filling of this superior temporal arcade. And that as you extend farther along, uh, she has normal filling of her right eye, but again, even at three minutes is still not really filling very much through the superior temporal arcade. Um, so at this point, our, you know, the questions that we were asking was what should we consider in terms of our differential? Uh, what do we think she has? Is there any other testing that we would recommend just from our findings with her associated neurologic symptoms and what recommendations would we make to the primary team? So her differential is, I mean, somewhat extensive, so she is, you know, looking at her findings on her FA, she has a, a branch retinal artery occlusion in a young patient with these other associated neurologic findings. So you're think, thinking most likely of, you know, potentially something that could be causing these branch retinal artery occlusions and maybe a similar process in the brain. So you have to be thinking about vasculitic conditions, but also some infectious inflammatory conditions as well, potentially. Uh, so the things that she got done when she presented, uh, she had an MRI which sh showed these subcortical lesions in multiple vascular territories, um, and most notable in the corpus callosum. We'll see the images in just a second. And then she also had some leptomeningeal enhancement. Uh, she had a normal ultrasound. As you remember, she had a PFO, so thinking, did she have a clot in her legs that was then going uh, up into her arterial system? Uh, which was fine. She had a normal CTA. She actually got a cerebral angiogram. They were wondering about a vasculitis 
uh, uh, which she did not have. This was actually done prior to when she had her imaging done here at the Moran. Uh, and then she had a fairly significant uh, coagulation workup, all of which was unremarkable. She also had a lumbar puncture, which did not show any signs of infection or inflammatory component. So uh, we felt based on uh, all of this workup, as well as our discussion with the neurology team, that she likely had SUSAC syndrome. So just quickly a review, and then I kind of wanted to go over her case and follow up. SUSAC syndrome, syndrome is an autoimmune disease. It was first described in 1979 although kind of the major paper that describes it was in 94, where he has a large series of cases that he presented. Um, and most times, it affects females between the age of 20 to 40. There's a large female to male preponderance. Interestingly, just as a consideration, you know, this is a very similar age range to where you see patients presenting with multiple sclerosis. And you'll oftentimes see uh, there's a chance for misdiagnosis of SUSEX as multiple sclerosis based on the MRI findings and sort of obscure neurologic symptoms. The classic symptoms is sort of a triad of brain, eye, and ear typically. So um, the biggest thing is they usually will have this headache and sort of mental status confusion. Um, they may also have associated personality changes as well. Um, and then the eye is usually visual changes related to having recurrent branch retinal artery occlusions. And then they also will, often will have hearing loss that's bilateral or associated with vertigo as well. So if you are in clinic and you're starting to see this sort of conglomeration of pictures, particularly with the unusual mental status, this is things that you want to consider. This is a really great paper that reviewed all of the reported cases as of 2013. So just of note, they had 304 cases. So you'll see the numbers here on the left are of the cases that they looked at, the, how many of them actually had data and then the percentage of that. So of note, you know, again, primarily 80% are female. Most of their patients were Caucasian. Um, and then the age is usually in the kind of young, mid-30s. Also of important note, just from a prognostic standpoint, so about half of the patients had a monocyclic or sort of one-time incident that then did, they did not have recurrence with treatment. Um, but close to 50% had a sort of a polycyclic or uh, multiple recurrences. And if you looked at their, this set of patients, so they had 201 which had relapses, um, and the mean of that was about two and a half relapses even though they were on treatment. So there is a pretty significant risk for relapse, and so one of the questions is how can you best predict who might relapse and who may need more aggressive treatment so that they do not relapse? Um, Russ, yes. I have a question. For, for the ethnicity, it, do we know if they're sampling bias or is it primarily uh, I don't have a great answer for that. Uh, I don't know. These were all, these were mostly all um, uh, American studies. There was a few that were outside of um, uh, the U.S., um, but a lot of them were U.S. studies, so there probably is somewhat of a sampling bias. But. Uh, in terms of clinical presentation, I think this is an important thing just to note, is that if you look at presentation, only 13% uh, of cases had the complete triad at presentation. Um, the majority, about two-thirds of them had CNS involvement, and then about 40% had either ear or eye involvement at presentation. Throughout the course of their disease, almost everyone sort of eventually had all three. Um, 85% had all three, but it's just important to know that they may not have all three at presentation, so you kind of have to keep this in your differential. Um, this is a very busy slide, but again, just pointing out the fact that from a CNS standpoint, broadly described, about 80% of, 75% have an encephalopathy of some sort, with about 50% kind of presenting with these sort of vague confusion or somewhat uh, cognitive impairment that's somewhat difficult for patients to describe and thus often sometimes difficult for us as physicians to pull out if we're not patient in our history taking. In terms of clinical findings, so she has like the really classic uh, retinal findings, what has been termed as a gas plaque because he was the, um, one of the first people who wrote about it. Um, but this sort of yellow-white retinal arterial plaque. And importantly, it usually does, you sort of think of branch artery occlusions that occur at the bifurcation when they're from a cholesterol or other emboli. These usually are not at the bifurcation. They're sort of mid-arterial um, and in between the bifurcations. The MRI findings, so this is our patient's MRI findings, and 
The, the biggest thing to note is it does commonly affect the corpus callosum. Usually in the active phase, they describe them as these sort of snowball lesions that then evolve into these sort of punched out lesions. So this is her follow-up MRI a year later, and you can see she, there's almost these like punched out lesions in these areas, in the areas of the corpus callosum. But you can see how this pattern could somewhat be confused with sort of the Dante's fingers are associated with um, MS. They do look different, but something to consider. Almost universally, the cerebral angiogram will be negative because the vessels that are affected are too small to pick up on cerebral angiogram. Um, so if you have a really high suspicion, actually fluorescein angiogram is a better screening and also obviously way less invasive for the patient. So, um, And then as we talked about, the OCT, I mean, it should show classic findings of branch retinal artery occlusion, so you will see the disruption of the inner retinal layers, so that can be helpful as well. The treatment, um, there's a wide variety of treatments that are used, but most of these people end up getting uh, high-dose oral steroids initially and then some sort of immune-modulating therapy during the first you know, one to three years, depending on how active their disease is. Um, cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate are the kind of the two most classic. There's a few descriptions of some people using newer biologics, but most people still prefer uh, cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. And then you can also use IVIG as a therapy for disease that's breaking through um, conventional IMT. The pathophysiology is still somewhat unknown, so it is affecting these small arterioles, and there's some thought that it's some sort of endothelial dysfunction, but it's not well understood still at this point. Um, and the prognosis, unfortunately, is really difficult to tell patients at their presentation. So as we talked about, you know, 50% of people will have one episode, they'll get better, but close to 50% will have a recurrent course, and it's hard to predict at onset who will be which one. So I just wanted to provide um, some follow-up for this patient. So she presented, she was um, started on oral prednisone and oral Celsept. She actually did quite well with that. She had um, improvement in her neurologic status. She did do um, some physical training, uh, physical therapy, um, and she was really quite stable. She was on a gradual prednisone taper. We saw her in March. At that point, her exam looked pretty normal. We did a wide field FA, which I think will be a really useful modality looking forward in the future. But interestingly, what you saw is you got to the later phases in her wide field FA, though she was asymptomatic, she did have these sort of areas of peripheral retinal vascular staining, which could likely indicates there's still some level of activity, disease activity at that point. But she was completely asymptomatic from a neurologic standpoint and from a, you know, not having any new visual field defects. So our, ser our service here had discussed these findings with the neurology team who was managing her, suggested that it did look like there was maybe still some activity, um, but it wasn't you know, overly significant that they may want to adjust the IMT. The neurology service uh, took those considerations into effect. They uh, continued to decrease or offer oral prednisone and just keep her on the dose that she was on. And she actually did really well. She didn't have any recurrence of her symptoms. She missed two follow-ups with our for follow-up wide field FAs. And then she presented in November of 2015 with new onset symptoms in both eyes. She, at that point, she had decreased down to five milligrams of oral prednisone. And when you saw her, when we saw her in November, she had a, a new cotton wool spot over in this right eye. And then she also had this small <coughs> ciliaretinal artery. Uh, occlusion that was sort of right near her fovea as well. <coughs> and again, in this FA you'll see she has very extensive uh, retinal vascular involvement in both the right eye and the left eye. Um, you can see on her OCT this new area of arterial occlusion and disruption of the inner retina. So she was again admitted, she was started on oral prednisone, Celsept, and then initiated on IVIG therapy. Um, and then since that point she's had stable vision she came in in January to a uh, clinic here. Her pre-auth was not done for FA, so she did not get one. Then she missed her January appointment, so she hasn't had a repeat FA. Um, and the plan from neurology standpoint is to taper her off her prednisone until she gets to 20 milligrams and then probably maintain her on that dose. She, um, and potentially, if she has recurrence, start her on cyclophosphamide as well. So the, the questions that I had from this case that sort of came up in my mind were, you know, I think the wide field FA is actually, it's not described anywhere in the literature as a possible screening mechanism for SUSEX, but I think it may be, I'd be curious about both retina, uveitis, and neuro-ophthalmology's perspective 
on using it as a monitor for active disease. And if we're seeing uh, changes like we did in March, should we be more aggressive in our recommendations to the neuro neurology team who's monitoring her immune modulating therapy and be more aggressive in encouraging them to either not taper off the steroids or start her on additional therapy at that point? So I'd just be curious. And then the other thoughts were, what's kind of the best service for these patients to follow up at the Moran? This patient's been seen in retina and uveitis and neuro-ophthalmology at various times, has missed appointments in all of those services. Uh, it seems like it would be good for them to have sort of a consistent person or group to go to. So I'd open it to the floor for comments. Yeah, I mean, these patients really need a multidisciplinary team approach. <coughs> Part. Thanks, sir. Yes. Russell, with the cognitive issues that you mentioned, mm -hmm. patients, the no shows are kind of a red flag. Yep. And this is the kind of patient that needs somebody, either responsible family or something assigned to write her on, because it may not be just a simple matter. I didn't show up for the appointment. It Maybe may be, I, I forgot. Remember to yep. come to an appointment. Okay. Exactly. It may be a really sad state of affairs. Yep. We didn't jump on that. Yep, absolutely. That cognitive issue. When she initially presented in the outside hospital, yep. had she a prior history of cognitive dysfunction? No, she hadn't had a prior issue. Uh, no, she had not. They <laughs> correct. She had prior history of migraines, and they thought that it was maybe an atypical migraine. Okay. But they they felt confident with their normal CT scan, and they didn't find any other neurologic deficits. So. Okay. Um, one thing they're not using is cyclophosphamide anymore because of the bladder cancer. Hmm. And so they're moving uh, drastically toward biologics uh, and away from cyclophosphamide, especially, um, and some of the harder biologics to tolerate. Um, another thing that I found uh, really interesting is that Gas hated the name Gas Class. <laughs> he never wanted it named after himself, but John Susack. I named it after. after uh, named the plaque after gas died. So their actually arterial wall uh, plaques is what gas wanted them to be called. Um, but that was an interesting tidbit. But uh, there's a lot of um, updated um, little trinkets of information that we got um, from that lecture. And I think that updating neurology and ENT and having those discussions, like Dr. Katz mentioned, uh, people can bring in their own uh, up-to-date, most recent um, papers and data and educate our colleagues about these things, too. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Graham. Thanks, everyone.